Good morning. Very warm welcome to everybody. It is so nice to see so many smiling faces. Even though it is a bit chilly outside. Just a couple of announcements. Shirley is uh, still away visiting her daughter. Um, and we've got Rupert, Rulon, and Leah with us this morning. Bye, welcome. <coughs> bye, Lacro Miela, we have to see you. Bye, bye, Lacro Miela, we have to see you. Then we've also got Robin Marion from Sedgefield. Very nice to see you. And. Uh, then we've got John, Eric, and Craig from Neisner. Very nice to see you guys. Very nice to see you. Danny, Stephanie, and Israella from the other side. Great crack. Bye, Valko Manjela. <clears throat> Danny Lentwick. Bye, Lacro Miela to see you. It's so nice to see everybody here this morning on this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day that you've been blessed with once again. Then, oh yes, we've got Kirsten visiting with Adrian and Gabby. She comes down every, every now and again. Nice to see you as well. Um, then, just some feedback on the men's meeting that we had uh, last week. Um, before I get to that, the ladies, can you please see Gabby and uh, Antoinette afterwards, please, regarding the fellowship meal the 7th of August. Okay. It's happening. <laughs> the 7th of August. Then also, <clears throat> the 7th of August, we are going to start a Bible study um, here before the service. So 9.30, and it's only for about 20 minutes, so 9.30 to 10 to 10, we're going to have a, a Bible study, and we're going to have a 10 minute break before we start the service. Okay, so that will be starting not next week, but the week after that. Then, we have got... No birthdays, no anniversaries, and then um, short feedback on our finances. The black is the expenses and the blue is the income. And you see there in 2019, our um, expenses outstripped our income. Okay, then in 2020, both of them dropped because of the lockdown and then from 2021 it started picking up again our finances are outstripping well uh, income is outstripping our expenses and 2022 it is uh, also picking up as well okay our expenses amount to about four and a half thousand five thousand rand a month at this uh, point in time. And then um, our, we've got our, <clears throat> the fellowship meal the 7th of August. Our tea and cookies uh, and benevolence is Adrian and Gabby's portfolio. They are, we are supporting two families at this stage. Then we've also got um, Marklin that we've appointed as our, for visitations and, um, you know, checking, he's going to check up who's here and who's not here. Okay, so, uh, better watch out, eh? <laughs> and if you're not here, he's going to phone you and ask you why you haven't been here. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, Mark is going to be doing that. He's going to keep an eye 
you know, if there's somebody that's not here for a while, you know, find out if there's a problem, if there's something that you can help with and so on. Uh, feedback, which is my mounted edge portfolio. Um, we had one, we've got Sunday School for one, and um, it's just increased by 300%. So, <laughs> instead of one, we've suddenly gone up to three, which is, which is very, very nice and very encouraging to see. Then, let me see, who have I missed out? Was there anything else? I think I've got about everything. Is there something I missed? Alright. Uh, birthdays, we just had on to Shirley last week. Uh, we've got no anniversaries coming up this month. Well, this month, unfortunately. Um, you can skip that for the table. Sorry? You can skip that for the table. Skip that? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> Any other announcements? <clears throat> no other announcements. Okay, if there are no other announcements, let us then open our worship this morning with a word of prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we are truly blessed once again <clears throat> to be able to come before your throne of grace and mercy and peace this morning. Father, grateful for all the blessings that you daily bestow on us. Father, for this beautiful day that you've given to us, for the rain that you've sent upon this earth to bring nourishment to the ground, Father. Father, as we gather here in your presence to gain nourishment for our souls this morning. Lord, we are so grateful and always so encouraged to see our brothers and sisters gathered together in this place, Father, to come and to worship you together. Father, we are also mindful of those that could not be with us on this day, Father, due to circumstances and various reasons, and therefore we ask you to be with them as well. Father, for those that travel great distances to be with us, Lord, we are grateful, and we ask you to give them traveling mercies as they travel back and forth, Father. For those amongst our number that are sick, that are weak, that are struggling. Lord, you are the bulwark in our lives. You are our mighty fortress that we can run to, that we can gain refuge and strength from, Father. Lord, you are like an eagle covering its young with its wings, and you cover us with your mighty pinions, Father. Lord, you are the great healer, you the, are the ultimate physician, and therefore we bring before you those amongst the number that are sick, that are battling illnesses, <clears throat> and we ask you to be with them, Father, in a very special way. Grant them comfort and strength to be able to endure what they have to endure, Father, on this earth. Father, that you will be with us this morning, that you will guide us in everything that you do. Lord, that our worship to you may be acceptable in your sight and will rise before your throne as a fragrant offering. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to be a worker for the Lord.
I've said the last couple of weeks that when when uh, when Ronald asked me to do the Lord's table, I thought I want to just share one scripture. You know, we can all read a scripture ten years later, five years later, twenty years later, and read something else that you didn't realize. You know, at the time when you read it. So when I read this, when I read Deuteronomy 31 verse 8, I'm sure we've all read it a hundred times. But given the circumstances that have been the past while, I read and I thought to myself, what a great message for a lesson, for a table. What a great message for, if you think of Jesus hanging on the cross, and you read that, it's, it reads, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Jesus Christ fortunately went before us. So we don't have to fear or be dismayed. And that really is the one scripture that I want to leave with you today. It's a sum title of the, of the Lord's table for today. Just, you know, sometimes it doesn't need a lesson. Sometimes it doesn't need much understanding apart from just reading. And let's read it one more time. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Let us pray. <coughs> Lord, as we come together here this morning as, as family, as Christians, and as friends, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to partake of these items. As we to partake of Lord. Please, each and every one of this morning, knowing that as we take this Lord, we can just once again be grateful that you took upon sin. You were there before us, Lord, and that you will never forsake us. Thank you for this opportunity, and we ask it now in Jesus' name. Giving, Lord, is of oneself, first and foremost, Lord. And in the finances of the church, Lord, as we saw, just like everything, Lord, we've got some expenses to take care of. But you've blessed us, Lord, as a congregation, you've blessed us over and over. And we thank you for that, Lord. Give us the opportunity to apply the money wisely, Lord. 
apply to us the growth of this congregation at all times. We thank you for this opportunity to have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep in sin within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters left can be not saved.
that they damn the souls of men and women to hell while promising them heaven. In the 15th verse of this chapter 23, the Lord says to the scribes and the Pharisees, who were the false spiritual leaders of his day, you travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte or to make one convert to Judaism. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. False spiritual leadership has to be dealt with with great seriousness, for it condemns the souls of men and women in the illusion that they are serving God and are pleasing to Him. And that is why false spiritual leaders are the most cursed sinners in the Bible. And this particular chapter, chapter 23, is the greatest single tirade of Jesus that he makes against false spiritual leaders. In this chapter, Jesus fully denounces them. And as we saw, this chapter falls into several parts. <clears throat> it begins with a call to people to avoid the false teachers. Then there is a condemnation on these false teachers themselves. And then it ends with a compassionate word of pity for the people that have been under their influence. So it is a very significant chapter. It is a very stern chapter. And we saw three qualities that false spiritual leaders lack. Firstly, they lack authority. And you remember we talked about them sitting in the seat of Moses. There is no implication they had the right to be there. In other words, they were usurpers, they didn't belong there. And worst of all, they had substituted the Word of God for their own traditions and their own, and, and their own commandments, according to Matthew 15. Secondly, they lacked integrity. Integrity is consistency. And integrity means you live what you say. They didn't do that. In verse 3, Jesus says to it, Do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. And thirdly, they lack sympathy. In verse 4, they tie up heavy loads and lay, on them, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with as much as a finger. And we, the illustration we used was how they loaded up a donkey. And that is what they did to men. And they told the people that if you did enough good things, that if your good things pile exceeded your bad things pile, then you would be alright. You would go to heaven. But they never alleviated the burden. They never lifted a finger to try and help the people. Instead, they just piled it higher and higher and higher. And this burden became greater and greater. And it was compounded by the guilt, the burden of guilt, imposed on them by the inability to keep the rules. And so there was this double burden placed on the people. And there was never a message of mercy, never a message of hope, never a message of pity, and never a message of forgiveness, and never a gospel that sin is removed. It was always there, and it 
was piling up and piling up and accumulating and it might damn you one day unless your good pile is more than your bad pile was. It was an intolerable burden that they placed on the people. They lacked sympathy. There was no kindness. There was no sense of graciousness. Which is in stark contrast to which our Lord teaches when He said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It is in stark contrast what Paul writes to the Thessalonians and says to them, When we came to you, we will gentle among you as a nursing mother nurses a baby, cherishes her child. Now cherish means to warm with body heat. And Paul says the intimacy of that marvelous imagery of a nursing baby, that's how we were with you. That's how tender we were with you. That's how caring we were with you. The marvelous tenderness that marks a true shepherd, that marked the Savior, and that marked those who follow Him. Very different from the unsympathetic legalism and bondage of the false leaders who abused the people, who used the people, who piled on them and crushed them beneath the weight of their legalism, their rules, their regulations, which they pretended to fulfill, but they didn't. They were without sympathy. And then number four, they lack spirituality. Everything was for the outside, not the heart. All of their religion was for show. All of it was for fleshly gratification. They got ego satisf satisfaction out of their religious parading. They put on piety, their pompousness and their ostentation. They wanted to show people on the outside how pious they were so that they could get the homage and their reverence from the people. They sought physical gratification. It wasn't an issue of character with them. It was an issue of show. It is as at the end of Galatians, the Jews were into making a fair show for the flesh, verse 5. But all their works they did for what reason? To be seen by men. That was the whole purpose of them doing anything. He says in verse 1, Take heed and do not do your alms. In other words, your giving before men to be seen by them. That is what they were after, to be seen by people. And he goes on to say, when you do give, don't sound a trumpet before you. Now just try and imagine this scenario. When the Pharisees would come into the courtyard of the women, the walls were surrounded by containers for the various offerings. And when they would come, they would have someone go before them and he would play a fanfare on the trumpet. You know, almost like a king coming into the chamber, they play a fanfare. And that is to see, to get the people to see, hey, what's going on here? To get the attention of the people. So that everybody is watching them to see what they give, how pious, how holy, how devout, devout they were. And Jesus goes on to say, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the middle of the synagogue and in the crossroads of the street. Here they would pray their daily prayers right in the middle of everyone. 
They were going to stand literally in the middle of the street. And they would say their daily prayers. So that everyone around them could see how pious, how good uh, this person was, how virtuous they were. They would find the most public place to do that. And then in verse six, verses 16 to 18, he says, when they fast, don't be like the hypocrites and when they put on a sad face. They would literally sprinkle themselves with ashes. Make their faces pale, make their faces white. And they would go around to the people and say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. See, I'm fasting. It was all external. It was all a show for the people. In Jude 19, that de deals with false leaders, he says that they are those who separate themselves. They want to be considered the spiritual elite. They want to dress differently. They want to appear very pious. Sometimes they wear a backwards collar or a fancy robe or a funny hat, all kinds of stuff. They want to appear different than the ordinary people. They want to make a display of their piety. They want to separate themselves. They want to be creating some kind of separated identification as if they were greater, as if they were better than normal people. Even the word Pharisee may have come from a word which means to be separated. And generally the Pharisees thought of themselves as better than everyone else. Someone to be revered, someone to be honored, someone to be looked up to. And they were in it for the whole objective of being seen by men. And Jesus says to them in Matthew chapter 6, they have their reward. And what was that reward? That was to be seen by men. God will not reward them. Alternatively, God might even punish them. And notice in verse 5, the leaders or the Lord identifies them in several ways in which they wanted to be seen by men. And firstly, he says they make broad their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Again, everything was on the outside. The whole religious game with them was to be visible to the people. Nothing from the heart. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we will ultimately, those who serve Christ, will ultimately be judged by our heart. What our heart motives were what our purposes and what our drives were coming from the heart. And that is the true standard. Jesus calls them in scripture as whitewashed tombs, whitewashed walls, graves concealed by grass, broken pots covered with silver dross, they are called wolves in sheep's clothing. They are called wells without water, cloaks covering sin. They are even identified as hired weepers who will cry if the price is high enough. Everything they did was motivated by the desire for the honor of men. And Jesus exposes them. And while they are standing there with their large phylacteries and long tassels, Jesus is busy rebuking them. 
And this is a very dramatic scene that is portrayed here in the temple court. But what has it been to make large their phylacteries? In Deuteronomy in two places, Exodus in two places, Exodus 13, 9, Exodus 13, 16, Deuteronomy 6, 8, Deuteronomy 11, 18. Four places in total, the Old Testament says that the commandments of God are to be on your hand and between your eyes. The ancient Jews had no problem understanding what it meant. They, understand, they understood the significance of it. It was symbolic, saying that the commandments of God are to be the controlling factor in everything that we are to do. Very simple. In what we think and what we do, between the eyes speaks of the thought process. On the hand speaks to the act process. So when you think, think through the commandments of God. When you act, act through the commandments of God. In other words, that is to be a grid for our standing and thinking and all our living. Nobody had a problem with that. The Jews accepted it as a symbolic statement, a spiritual command that they were to give attention to God's words in all of their thoughts and in all of their actions. But unfortunately, as the centuries passed, the Jews began to develop an external, legalistic, outward approach to religion. What was once understood to be internal to the heart crawled to the outside. It left the heart and became a way to people parade or to parade their supposed piety. And so they became concerned to put literally the law of God on their hand and on the forehead, on the outside. They thought they were following God, following the letter of religion when their hearts were far from God. They thought that God would be pleased by the mechanical external legalism. There is no record of phylacteries until 400 BC, which places it in the intertestamental period. We found some relics in the Qumran community by the Dead Sea. So this was not something that the Jews always did. This didn't come until much later when an external system of religion was developed. Now you might ask the question, what are phylacteries? That picture on the board, that little box that they have on the forehead, the little box tied onto the hand, those are the phylacteries. The word means basically, and I quote, a means of protection. Another way to simply understand it is a charm or an amulet. The idea was that the Egyptians and the pagans living around them wore charms to ward off evil spirits. And the Egyptians were really into this kind of thing. And as the Jews drifted further and further away from God and moved further and further towards paganism, they wanted charms as well to ward off evil. 
They wanted things to ward off evil spirits, to ward off demons as a means of protection. And so they developed these phylacteries, these charms, these magical little boxes to ward off demons, which goes to show just how far their religion had deteriorated. They made them square and they covered them with black leather from a ceremonially clean animal. And then they connected them to each other with 12 stitches each. Each stitch representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Leather straps by which they could tie them to their forehead and onto their hand. As you can see the leather straps used there. In the box, well they tied it to their left hand which they said was closer to the heart. And in the box they put in four sections of the Mosaic Law. Exodus 13, 1-10. Exodus 13, 11-16. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9. And Deuteronomy 11, 13-21. And in one of those boxes, they put all of those little pieces, one of those onto one single parchment. And into another box they put in each one of them separately on a different piece of parchment. And they rolled up these little pieces of paper and they put them into these little boxes. And then they would strap it to their forehead and then they would tie it around their arm. This shows again the extent to which this whole magical approach of theirs has gone. And what's even worse, they said the phylacteries were more sacred than the gold plate on the forehead of the high priest, which had the name of God engraved on it, because they said inside these little boxes the name of God was written 23 times. Goes to show how far their religion had deteriorated from what was supposed to be internal, had crept to the outside, had become an external thing. It was never there. Only 400 years before Christ that they start to develop it. Characteristics of false spiritual leaders. Angry words of
Waldo. It was good for us to be here. Father, good for us to have been able to assemble this morning in your presence. Father, it was good for us to be able to partake of this table together. The emblem sac symbolizing the sacrifice of your son. Father, it was good for us to be here this morning to hear warnings again from your word. Father, it is easy to read through your word and to point fingers at others. But Father, help us to take these warnings to heart ourselves as well. Father, to use your word as a mirror to see that we are doing what you want us to do. Father, that we are following your word. Lord, not in a legalistic point by point system kind of way, but Father, from the heart. Lord, true religion that comes from the heart, true love to you, for you that comes from the heart, that encompasses our whole being, our mind, our thought, our spirit, our soul, Father. Help us to take these warnings to heart. Father, it was good to be here this morning to be able to see again our brothers and our sisters. Father, to see their smiling faces, Lord, as we, they came and as we came together to worship you. And Father, as we leave this place this morning, we ask a blessing upon each one. And Father, that you will bring us together at the next appointed time. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name alone. Amen.